This morning we're continuing to, uh, actually we're back into the Gospel of John. We, we did take a, uh, a month off. And I hope we don't lose what it is we saw this past month. All the encouragements to get engaged in that commission that our Lord Jesus Christ has given to us. Uh, to bring the Gospel to all the nations. And remember, we, all of us are called to be missionaries. Uh, we don't need to see missionary work as being purely cross-cultural and purely, uh, as it were, in, on other continents, as it was in the case of, of at least two of the missionaries we looked at, as William Carey went to India and as David Livingston went to Africa. But we also saw that David Brainerd worked in that country that he was in among the uh, American uh, of the Native Americans and how uh, George Mueller worked among the orphans uh, on the streets uh, in the UK. The important thing is that we be reaching out with the gospel and the reason being is of course the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to honor him, we want to love him and do what he calls us to do in gathering in his sheep but also so that our neighbor won't fall under the condemnation that we read about this morning in John chapter 7. What I'd like to do is read verses 32 through 36 and may the Lord speak to us through these words this morning. John 7 verse beginning in verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him and I'll just simply say they were thinking that Jesus might be the Messiah and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him Therefore Jesus said, for a little while, a little while longer, I am with you. Then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews then said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? He is not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? What is this statement that he said, you will seek me and will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now it has been a few weeks since we were in John's Gospel, so I'll just give you a bit of review. Last time, uh, we saw something that wasn't unusual. We saw the Jews were divided as to exactly who Jesus was. And the actions of their leaders didn't really help matters because one moment they wanted to kill him and the next they seemed to be leaving him alone. I mean, the fact that Jesus was at the feast and that he was speaking publicly, but the leaders weren't doing anything about it, only further confused them. Does this mean that our leaders believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Now, John tells us that this wasn't the case. They didn't believe they still wanted to arrest him. They still wanted to kill him. They just didn't dare do it at the feast in front of all these people because it would have started a riot. It would have brought the Romans quickly into the picture. The Romans would have taken away their place, taken away their country. They would lose everything. So no, they had to buy their, buy their time until Jesus was alone. Then they would take him secretly. Now, the leaders didn't believe, but John tells us many of the Jews actually did. They believed because of the signs that Jesus was performing. John writes in verse 31 of chapter 7, But many of the crowd believed in him. And they were saying, when the Christ comes, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? Uh, this reminds us that real miracles, and Jesus did real miracles, not those hidden miracles, you know, where yeah, I feel like something happened, I feel this warm sensation, whatever. He did things that stopped traffic. He did things that immediately you could see something supernatural happen. And it would create wonder, it would create amazement, it would create terror because they knew God was present. Real miracles have evidential power. And they prove that Jesus is who he claimed to be. These people just could not believe that anyone could do more than this man had done. What Jesus did proved he was who he said he was. Now again, where does this leave the Jewish leaders? 
You know, the question we need to ask ourselves this morning is, did the Jewish leaders really have any legitimate reason not to believe that Jesus was the Messiah? I mean, if, if anyone was without excuse, it was certainly them. Remember, they were the religious experts. They were the ones who studied the Scriptures. They copied it so much that they knew it very well. The scribes were the lawyers. They were schooled in the Scriptures. The Pharisees were the religious leaders. The Sadducees had power over the temple. They all knew the Scriptures. They knew them very well. They knew what the Scriptures said about the Christ. They knew what He would do when He came. They knew that God would allow only the Christ to do these things. There were things peculiar to Jesus that He alone did. And we've seen some examples of that. Never has it been heard that a man has opened the eyes of the blind. That's something that only the Messiah would do. And they knew that Jesus had, in fact, done these things. In other words, they knew Jesus was the Christ. But knowing that that's who he was, what did they do? Did they trust him the way they should? Did they obey him? Did they submit to him? Did they receive him? Did they receive his salvation? No. I mean, look at what the leaders were doing. They wanted to arrest him. They wanted to kill him. And that's why Jesus says to them this morning, Where I am, you cannot come. By the way, we're not going to have a chance to get into this, but I want you to notice that Jesus says, Where I am. Well, where was Jesus? He was right there. Where I am, you can't come. Well, does that mean he, they can't step forward and step for, stand where he was standing? No, because Jesus also meant by this that he was going to go to heaven and that's where they could not go. But notice he says, where I am. He was already in heaven. Again, this just reminds us of the two natures of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even though he's on earth, he's also in heaven. Where I am, you cannot come. This morning I want us to consider three things here. What it was that Jesus was saying to them why he said it, and how we can escape his saying the same thing to us. First of all, let's consider what Jesus was really saying to them. I believe he was charging the Jewish leaders here with the unpardonable sin. Again, we see this in verse 34. Jesus says to the Jews, you will seek me and will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Now, to whom is Jesus speaking in this particular verse? Well, he appears to be speaking to those who are mentioned in verse 32. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. Now, we need to realize the Pharisees were also at this feast. Remember, this is a feast that all the Jewish males had to attend and they heard what the crowd was saying. They wouldn't be able to hear it unless they were there. That Jesus had done more than enough to prove to, him, to the people that he was in fact the Christ. And it concerned them enough to have him arrested, which is why they sent the chief officers or the, the officers after him to arrest him. Now it wasn't just what the crowds had said, but of course they were still reeling, as it were, over the fact that Jesus had healed a man on the Sabbath. Now, their sending officers to arrest him appears to be what prompted Jesus to say what he says in verses 33 and 34. We read, Therefore Jesus said, For a little while longer I am with you, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. In other words, it was the chief priests, the, the Pharisees, sending the officers that made Jesus say this. Therefore, Jesus said. I believe that Jesus is addressing what he is addressing here to the Jewish leaders as well as the members of the crowd who also saw his miracles but did not repent but hardened their hearts against him. Now, what was it he was actually telling them? Well, first of all, he said that... Um, he would be with them only for a little while longer. This was the Feast of Booths. The Feast of Booths was about six months away from the Passover. The Passover, the next Passover, was the one in which Jesus would be betrayed and handed over to the Jews and then by the Jews over to the Romans to be crucified. 
So about six months, a little while longer, and I am, uh, that I'm going to be with you. After he was going to be crucified, he would go to the one who sent him. He would return to his father. Now we know when Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. We know that at that moment when Jesus yielded up his spirit that he went to be with his father. He didn't go into hell and suffer as some people teach, but rather he went to be with his father even as he told the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. So he went to be with his father. And then, of course, once he was raised, when his uh, soul went back into his body and his body returned to life, he spent another 40 days with his disciples teaching them about the kingdom of heaven before he ascended again to the Father who is in heaven. So this is where Jesus Christ, of course, was going. He would be with them a little while longer, and then he would go to be with the Father. Jesus said after this, you will seek me and will not find me. Now what does Jesus mean here? That suddenly they're going to have a change of heart, suddenly they're going to seek after Jesus, but now they can't find him any longer? I, I don't think so, but I think rather what Jesus means is you're going to seek the Messiah and you're not going to find him. They were going to continue to look expecting that the Christ was going to come. I mean, after all, the 70 weeks of Daniel was up. The Messiah should be there. But they weren't going to find him because he had already come and they had already rejected him. And then Jesus says what, of course, is the most chilling thing of all, and where I am, you cannot come. That is, where I am with the Father, you will not be able to be there as well. Now, Jesus will later tell his disciples something quite similar in John chapter 13, verse 33. He says, little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Now, it almost sounds like Jesus is telling his disciples the same thing. You're not going to be able to come with me. You're not going to be able to go to heaven. But in this case, Jesus reminds them this is only for the time being. This isn't permanent. They couldn't come now, but they would later. In verse 36 of that same chapter, we read this. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Now, in our passage, there doesn't appear to be a later he says, where I come, or where I am, you cannot come. These Jewish leaders would not be in heaven because they had committed the sin which has no forgiveness. There is a line that one can cross over. And that brings us to the second point. Why does Jesus charge them with this sin? Why does he say this to them? Why would they not be able to come? Why are they excluded from heaven? I mean, is there a line that one can cross, that one can cross over, a point of no return? Is there a sin that God will not forgive? Well, you know, of course, that that is the case. There is a sin that has no forgiveness. Now, Matthew tells us that when Jesus, on one occasion, had cast a demon out of a man who was both blind and mute, so that he could see and speak, the leaders accused him of being in league with the devil. We read in Matthew 12, verse 24, but when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Now, why did they make this accusation? Did they really believe that? I mean, they knew that Satan would never have done this. They knew that he wouldn't try to tear down his own kingdom. They knew God was the only one who actually would do this, that would actually free someone from Satan's tyranny. They knew that Jesus must have done this by the power of God and by the Spirit of God, that he must be the Messiah. And yet, they still purposely slandered him. And they slandered that spirit by which he did these things. Now, how do we know that this is what was going on with them? How do we know that this is why they did this? Because it's exactly what Jesus tells them. In verses 25 through 30, 
And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Now again, we need to ask the question, if they actually knew that Jesus was the Messiah, if they knew these things were true, if they knew Satan couldn't do this, and that it must be by the power of God that this demon was cast out, why did they accuse Jesus of doing what he did? By the devil. No, it's because they hated him. They were envious of him and his influence with the people, of the fact that he was the Messiah. As I mentioned earlier, this threatened their position with Rome. They didn't want to give it up. And so they slandered Jesus by accusing him, note, of the foulest thing that they could possibly think of, that he did this so-called miracle, which they were saying was basically a deception, by the foulest of all spirits. He did this by the devil. Now, what does such a crime, what does such a sin as this deserve when you, when you basically refuse the Messiah and make such accusations against him fully from the heart, knowing that he is, in fact, the one God had promised? Well, Jesus tells them in verses 31 and 32, Therefore I say to you that any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. What was Jesus telling them here? Basically, that they are damned. This sin deserves damnation. Now, we shouldn't be surprised because we know they already deserved damnation, didn't they? They came into this world dead in trespass and sin. They came into the world guilty of at least the one sin of Adam, and they have not only were guilty of that, but have compounded it over the years through all their subsequent sins. We all deserve damnation. We don't need to commit another sin to deserve it. We deserve it now. So what actually was, was happening here? Well, this is basically a declaration by God that he is no longer going to offer them grace, the grace by which they might have been saved from those sins. And they, of course, compounded their situation by committing an even more serious sin. You know, the Bible does say that there are degrees of punishment in hell. And the more we sin, the more we're going to be punished. And this particular sin is extreme. And it deserves even greater punishment. Jesus is telling us here that it is possible to so resist the Spirit of God, to so grieve the Spirit of God, to so offend the Spirit of God that He can withdraw forever. And it doesn't have to happen just by accusing the Spirit of God. It can happen by resisting the Spirit of God making it virtually impossible to repent and believe because you can't repent and believe unless the Spirit of God works in your heart. And if He withdraws forever, that's it. There's no more salvation. Now these leaders, instead of receiving Jesus, instead of bowing down to Jesus because they knew He was the Messiah and there was no question, called for officers to have Him arrested so they could kill Him. If you choose to be God's enemies when he offers to you his mercy and his grace, eventually you're going to cross a line where the Lord is no longer going to show mercy, but he's going to begin to treat you as enemies. By the way, you know, our reason for resisting the Spirit of God and 
grieving and quenching him is not going to be the same as theirs, but it is going to have something to do with the same thing they wanted, and that is the world's. If you keep giving up Jesus Christ because you want the world, eventually you're going to lose your opportunity to enter into heaven. And I think from the examples we have in Scripture of those who actually cross the line, you're not going to care. They were so blinded by their sins, they didn't even understand what Jesus was telling them. They thought he was saying they were, that he was about to leave Palestine, that he was going to go to where the Jews had been dispersed throughout the Roman Empire and preach the gospel to them, by the way, oh, and to the Gentiles, which is exactly what the Apostle Paul did when the Lord called him. He went to the dispersion throughout the entire Roman Empire, preaching to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. That's what they thought Jesus was saying. We read in verses 35 and 36, the Jews then said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? He is not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? What is this statement that he said, you will seek me and will not find me and where I am you cannot come? They were so blind they didn't even realize that Jesus was pronouncing a curse upon them. It was far worse than the fact that he was just going to go to another part of the Roman Empire. Uh, he was telling them he was going to go to heaven and they could not come. Now finally and most importantly, how can you escape? How can you escape the same sentence? Because there are a number of people who are going to fall under this condemnation in the world living today who may already be under it. As I already asked the question, is this a sin that can be committed today? Or do we have to have those exact circumstances under which they were committed in the days of Jesus? Well, I think the answer is yes, one can commit this sin. One can cross over the line. One can go too far and sin against too much light. I mean, just think about Hebrews chapter 6. How many times have you read Hebrews chapter 6 and wondered whether or not you fell into that category? You see, here's the question. Have you committed this sin if this is a, a sin you can commit today? Will Jesus ever say these words to you? Has he, has he in fact said these words? Well, thankfully, the answer is no if you've already turned from your sins and you're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you are, there is no possibility that you will ever fall under this condemnation. You are safe. You are forever safe. You are forever sure that you are going to make it to heaven. Now, you may fall into serious sin. I mean, think about David. David committed adultery with Bathsheba. He had Uriah put to death. He's a murderer, and he's an adulterer, and yet David is in heaven. And think about Peter. Not only did he deny the Lord Jesus Christ, but he fell into hypocrisy uh, when he was keeping himself away from the Gentiles for the sake of the Jews to keep up appearances. Paul rebuked him to his face. Christians sin. Sometimes they commit serious sins, but they will never commit this sin because the Lord will make sure that you don't. Listen to what Jesus says again in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29, perhaps the most encouraging words of all the Scripture. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. Now, when Jesus says that, does he mean only as long as they follow him? Only as long as they trust in him? I give eternal life to them if they're confessing me now, but if they stop confessing me, I'm going to take that eternal life away from them, and they're going to perish? No, Jesus says, I know them. They hear my voice, I know them, they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. If you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, you will never perish. How do you know that you've trusted him? You hear his voice, and you follow him. Obedience is tied up in this at all times. We must obey him. We will because we love him. Not only will you never lose your salvation will never perish but it's also impossible for anyone to take you away from him and no one he says will snatch them out of my hand my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand 
if, if you're in the Father's hand, there's just no way that anybody's going to be able to take you away from him. Who is stronger than God? There's not even a close second. Satan is not an equal and opposite power. He is infinitely less. He is a creature. And he has no ability to take you away from, from God. So you are secure. That's why Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians 1.6. For I am confident, he says, of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. If he began that work, he will complete it. And then, as he writes to the Romans in Romans 8, verses 38 and 39, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you have trusted Jesus, if you love him, if you're following Jesus Christ now, you will make it to heaven. And as I've already mentioned, yes, there are times when you will fall into sin, but the Lord will never allow you to fall entirely away from Him. He will preserve you. So if you're a believer here this morning, if you've trusted Jesus, if you're following Him, you're turning from your sins, you cannot commit this sin. But the same is not true for those of you who haven't turned from your sins and trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, or if you only think that you have, but you haven't really trusted Him, if you are not in Jesus Christ, you are always in danger of this sin. And if you continue to fight against the Spirit of God, as He speaks to you through His Word, as He shows you the danger that you're in, as he presents Jesus to you again through the gospel, you will eventually reach a point of no return. Now again, this is a particular danger for those of you who listen to the gospel week after week and you still have not trusted Jesus Christ, you still will not trust Jesus Christ, you are particularly at risk because every time the Spirit offers Jesus to you and you refuse, your heart becomes a little bit harder. And it's going to continue to harden until you reach the point of no return. Now, we've just seen in Scripture it's possible to reach that point before you die. I mean, the Pharisees did, didn't they? When they, uh, again, hardened their hearts so much against the Spirit of God that they accused Him of being a, a foul and unclean spirit. These Pharisees reached that point perhaps several years before they died, maybe even 40 years or longer. You can harden your heart against the Spirit so much that He will stop working in you to convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment, to bring you to Jesus Christ. If that happens, there is no longer any hope for you. Now, notice this as well. If it doesn't happen before you die, it's certainly going to happen when you finally do. See, the result's going to be the same, right? You're going to go down into hell from which you can never escape, from which you can never come out. So whether it happens before you die or it happens at death, the result's going to be the same. The horrifying eventuality that you will be in hell forever. So the question you need to ask yourself this morning is this. How can you prevent this from happening? Well, there's only one way. You have to come to Jesus. You have to look to Jesus. You have to believe in Him. You have to trust in Him. Again, not just believe the facts regarding Him. Yes, I know about Jesus. Yes, I know He exists. There are so many churches today, again, sadly, that are saying, if you believe the facts, that's enough, but there has to be more. You have to trust Him. You have to turn from your sins. You have to follow Him. You have to love Him. Now, if you have any concern at all for your soul that you might end up in a situation like this, 
then you haven't committed that unpardonable sin. There's still hope for you. The people who commit this sin look at Jesus Christ and spit in his face. They're the ones who, if Jesus were reigning somewhere on earth, would come and try to tear him off the throne and kill him. If that's not what's in your heart, then there is still hope for you. But again, you need to remember you must do something now before your heart reaches that point. You need to come to Jesus. Now, is that a difficult thing to do? Well, in some senses, yes. In some senses, no. When Jesus was on the cross, there were two thieves that were crucified, one on either side. And at the beginning of the crucifixion, when they were first put up there, they were both cursing Jesus Christ. They both hated him, taunting him. If you're the Messiah, come down off the cross, save yourself. And yet one of the two thieves at some point along the line suddenly had a change of heart. And in Luke 23, 42, we read this. He said, Jesus, remember me. When you come in your kingdom, remember me. He expressed a simple act of faith. He believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He trusted in Jesus. Even though he was a criminal and perhaps had been a criminal for many years, and even though he was in the very last moments of his life, he looked to Jesus and he was saved. Now Jesus also told him what would be the most comforting words that anyone could ever possibly hear in verse 43. Jesus said to that thief when he said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. He said, truly I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Wouldn't it be wonderful to hear those words? <laughs> to hear Jesus speak those words to you. Maybe not so much today, although yes, that would be wonderful too if you really love Jesus. But you know, that's exactly what Jesus Christ has said to you if you have already trusted him. It may not be that you're going to be with him today, although maybe you will if it happens to be the last day of your life, but it is going to happen Jesus will bring you to heaven. He's gone ahead of you to prepare a place. His whole life, his whole ministry was to prepare a place for you. If you've trusted Jesus, Jesus has already said these words to you. You will be with him in paradise. For those of you who haven't trusted him, this is what he will say to you. He will speak peace to your soul. If you will only look to him in faith, even as the thief on the cross looked to him, in faith, if you will only trust him this morning. He's not going to say, where I am, you cannot come, which he will say if you continue to resist him. But if you trust him, he will say, you shall be with me in paradise. Which do you want to hear? Where I am, you cannot come. Or you shall be with me in paradise it all has to do with whether or not you have trusted Jesus. If you haven't trusted him, do it now. Look to him now. Jesus is again issuing to you another invitation this morning. He actually commands you to come. He wants you to come. If you come, he won't cast you aside. If you come, he will give you life. Now the only thing that stands between you and him is not him. But it's the fact that you don't want to come because you need something that only Jesus can give you and that is His Holy Spirit. So how do you get the Holy Spirit? Well, you need to look to Him to give you the power to come to Him. You need to look to Him to give you the power to turn away from your sins. You need to look to Him to give you the power to trust in Him. You need to be reminded again this morning that Jesus is your only hope. And so look to Jesus and receive his salvation. Don't harden your heart again. Don't take another step closer to the unpardonable sin. Trust in Jesus today and be safe from the coming judgment. Well, let's bow in a moment of, of prayer. Let's, let's ask the Lord to help us to trust in Him if we haven't trusted in Him this morning.